I am Sandy Ouellette. And I am Nancy Marie. Co-chairs of Beyond the Mass Committee to evaluate scholarly doctoral projects. Next deadline for work to be considered to present on Beyond the Mask is October 1. Please complete the one-page application found on Beyond the Mask webpage to be considered. We look forward to working with you. Today's episode of Beyond the Mask is presented by the team at CRNA Financial Planning. Get a free consultation today to be guided through the complexities of investing and financial planning. Just visit crnafinancialplanning.com. And don't forget, listening to our podcast can earn you Class B credits. For more information on how you can submit them, check out the CE Credit tab on our website, beyondthemaskpodcast.com. Welcome to Beyond the Mask, innovation and opportunities for CRNAs and advanced practice nurses with certified financial planner Jeremy Stanley and CRNA Sharon Pierce. Jeremy Stanley has worked with CRNAs for more than 23 years, and Sharon Pierce is a former president of the AANA and the NCANA. Join us as we leave the operating room and learn the latest in the CRNA and advanced practice nurse industries. Beyond the Mask starts in 10, 9, 8, 7. Hello, Miss Pierce. What's happening today? Oh, just sitting here podcast taping with you and looking forward to the next one. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, it was nice outside when we first started doing this, and now the clouds have crept in. It looks a little like it's going to rain, you know. For real? Um, that quickly? Yeah, that quickly, you know. Well, sun's still, still shining sun? where I am. Well, you know, that's I always had the gray cloud over me, and you always had the sun <laughs> on you, you know. There you so, go. That's what's the different in the color of our hair, right? You know, <laughs> you got the sun, and you know, mine's a little darker, so you know, I get that's the clouds. It. So come, come <laughs> to the light, Jeremy. Come to the light. <laughs> All right, Carol Ann, come to the light. <laughs> Uh, well, Sharon, we've got, a, I think, another great show, and, and interesting, this is part of our um, doctoral series on dissemination, and uh, I'm kind of excited about this one, even though I have no idea what they're talking about, and hopefully I won't slaughter any of the words, but I will do my best, um, <laughs> and uh, so why don't you introduce our two guests who are very, very excited, they have some great things coming up in the next couple of days that I know they're going to be even more excited about than this podcast. Yes, I believe so. So we have Joanna, is it Brademeyer? Did I say Yeah, Brademeyer. Okay. But you go by Annie and we have Amanda Jansen with us Mm -hmm. and they submitted their work to our doctoral committee um, chaired by Sandy Ouellette and Nancy Marie and their project was chosen Um, to be on the podcast. So welcome, ladies. Thank Thank you. you. We're excited to be here. Yeah. And you guys had a dinner last night because you graduate Saturday, which is you graduate on the 13th. Mm -hmm. Well, the 13th is now a lucky day for you, ladies. That's right. So we graduate past boards and then we're out in the real world again, right? That's right. Yeah. And I know you're not looking forward to that, though, right? Oh, not at all. No. <laughs> the paycheck will be nice, though. Oh, We're excited. Yeah. Isn't that going to yeah, be you get, nice? Mm-hmm. You get to stop working for free. That's uh, right. It's been fun. Yeah. That's right. That's right. All right. And so your topic today, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of read this, does inserting peripheral nerve catheters over the needle decrease leaking from its insertion site? Mm-hmm. How did it do, Sharon? Yeah. You, uh, you did fantastic. Did I nail it? You did great. You did great. All right, so, all right. ladies, why don't you tell us some of the problems that are encountered by clinicians who place these peripheral nerve catheters and tell us about yeah. how you got started going down this path? Yeah, it's an interesting story. We studied it for three years, and um, we didn't realize that we'd be stepping in such a controversial topic because the people who put these catheters in are very passionate about the topic. So it's definitely a labor of love. So I'm just a fill you in, Jeremy, since, um, like you said, you don't, not a clinician. So these peripheral nerve catheters 
They are um, catheters that go into um, like a round of nerve and it kind of does what a single shot nerve injection will do, which is the majority of what um, nerve blocks are placed. But these catheters are stayed in, they stay in for about two to three days. Um, they are used for a lot of orthopedic procedures and the people who put them in, it's pretty labor intensive. So for our rotation, um, we did an acute pain service rotation and you had to follow up with these people, you know, every day and ask them how the catheter is doing. So um, it's a labor of love, and that's why we met a lot of people who feel very passionate one way or the other about our research. So our professor, he is in charge of a, an acute pain service out in uh, rural Missouri, and he asked us to look into this for him. They did a practice change in, within his acute pain service, so then the CRNA is acute pain. The chronic um, pain is managed by anesthesiologists. Um, the CRNA started placing these catheters differently, and they wanted us to look into see if it impacted their practice. So we were just, our goal for three years is looking into literature and then trying to contribute to the very, very meager amount of, I guess, literature that's out there concerning this topic. Right. And then just to kind of piggyback off, Annie, we had um, students prior to us kind of look into all the nerve blocks as a whole and found that um, the distal sciatic nerve block is what le leaks the most. So then we kind of came in with this practice change to see if using this new method would actually help decrease the leaking for this specific block. So again, in my limited knowledge, so my oldest daughter, um, this was back um, years ago now, she came home from school one day and she her hand was hurting and we couldn't figure out what was going on with her hand. We went to doctor after doctor. They can never figure it out. I'm not a CRNA, guys. My wife is. And she was like, you know, this this sounds like something, you know, more than what they're talking about. And she had a case that day with a young lady that had CRPS. And her arm was swollen up, you know, from this part down. And her hand was really big, and um, which is complex regional pain syndrome. And so... Sure enough, um, that's what Lauren was diagnosed with. After Sarah told us about it, we got to the right types of doctors. And we ended up going in and seeing um, an anesthesiologist who had a great reputation. And they, he was in a pain center. And because she had had this tremendous pain, I mean, it would hurt. But there was no reason for her to hurt. Like if you brushed her hand, it mm -hmm. would hurt. And um, so they end up doing, I think I'm saying this right, a ganglion block. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, going in and doing the reset in there with the ganglion block, and they did two of them, and it completely reset, and she was healed. So, um, so I do know that? a little bit about this. Oh, well, good, yeah. And how's she doing now with it? With her, She's yeah. doing great. Luckily, we're knock on wood. She did. She actually just graduated from nursing school last week, and uh, so okay. she's graduating from nursing school. She took a job at Duke, and then she's going to apply back and go back to anesthesia school. So, well, yeah. what you described is exactly why people do them. You know, whether it's chronic pain. Um, that I think there's a lot more uh, CRNAs getting into chronic pain for uh, a lot of that reason because you do make an impact on um, a lot of people's lives. And these catheters and nerve blocks that we speak about, those are more for the immediate post-operative period. Um, vast majority of them are for orthopedic procedures. So those are some of the most painful procedures out there. And a lot of the people that are getting them, elderly, um, you know, the ones that fall and break their leg or whatever, um, those are actually the most sensitive to um, what is used to control pain afterwards, such as opioids. I'm sure you probably discussed it. We know you discussed it. We listen to your podcast extensively in the past, but... Um, those are the type of people that really benefit from these catheters because it prolongs that analgesia that you get them from a single shot injection or extends it three, four days. From what we researched, that's usually the time where people use the most opioids. Um, you know, the elderly, the obese people, which in our study, we when we dive into it, we actually found that this what we looked into benefit a lot of people with excessive VMIs of greater than 40. Those are the at risk population that this um, treatment modality can really help. So I think that's also why we encountered a lot of people who felt very passionate about the anesthesiologists from both fields. I mean, they have very strong opinions about like what we studied. Today's show is brought to you by the folks at CRNA Financial Planning, an independent consulting firm that offers financial planning services exclusively to CRNAs and their families. From planning for a child's future college expenses to building a predictable income stream in retirement, the firm is committed to offering you comprehensive financial services, customized to fit your unique needs and objectives. If you have questions about your financial future, get them answered. Call the team at 855-304-3748. 
That's 855-304-3748. Or go online to crnafinancialplanning.com. Well, you know, you guys are CRNAs, so you do have a few opinions of people out there, you know. I always, yeah, yeah, I always say that CRNAs are laid back, type B personalities, you know. I mean, you know, so easy to get along with. And then I realized, no, nope, I'm married to one and she's more laid back than most. And, and I have a work wife that is one. Mm. Um, All right, but, now, uh, be careful. Oh, but, you know, so I get it. But so, our professor told us that we were going to learn that we are very type mm -hmm. A. We might think we're type B, but we're type B. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you you are, you have to be. So mm -hmm. how has changing the insertion method over the needle instead of through it, how does that impact leaking? Yeah, so that is where a lot of this controversy comes into. So peripheral nerve catheters, they were originally designed in the 1940s, like epidural catheters. So in that, it's where you take a needle, you introduce it to the space, and you throw this catheter through the needle, take the needle out. Well, the catheter that remains is in this hole, this tunnel that was created by a larger diameter. So the thought was, well, that's where the leaking's coming from. So anyone who places these catheters, um, the listeners out there will will tell you that it's a very frustrating thing, the leaking from these catheters. So the thought was, well, why don't we change it, reverse the diameters? So you know how a nurse put in peripheral IVs, the slide the catheter over needle, it was kind of the same thought. This idea didn't really gain a lot of traction because a lot of the peripheral nerve catheters were first used for um, the local anesthetics side effects, like um, the dilating properties of them for like ischemic limbs and all that. It wasn't really until like the late 1990s, early 2000s that people were really reusing them for just routine pain control for the orthopedic procedures. So it wasn't really until 2008 that this idea was actually, you could see it in the literature that um, it gained some traction. And it was with a very, um, very popular, widely cited, if you ever use an over a needle kit, the guarantee the company has cited this study. It was an ex vivo pig study where they um, two researchers um, took an over a needle set that they designed and um, they started to uh, use it for they, they put into cadaver pig legs and to see whether or not it could withstand high pressure infusion rates from machines and they found overwhelmingly that putting it over the needle worked well then after that study there has only been from what we can find about five randomized control that specifically addresses that. So, you know, clinicians out there are using these catheters, but whether or not putting it over the needle or through is based off of kind of their opinion, because there's not a lot of research out there to make good evidence-based practices concerning whether or not it actually impacts it. Right. And the studies that are out there that we found, a lot of them are funded by the people who are for the catheter over the needle. So we're kind of like, how you know, valid can this study truly be? And yeah. on top of that, they don't address the larger BMIs. So they usually cap it at about 35, where unlike our study, I think we included BMIs, I think was it 60, wow. I think. Well, if, so you, we if you have a BMI of 35, I don't know where how it is where you guys give anesthesia, but here, that's the floor. <laughs> that's a good day to get a BMI of 35. Yes, so <laughs> and that's why we included it, because, you know, right. all that's reflective of where we're at here mm -hmm. in Missouri and of the rural population we studied. We did a retrospective study of... Um, chart reviews. So this practice change was implemented for the distal sciatic, which is also known as a popliteal block for listeners out there that might get a little confused. So yeah, that's the patient population. So we included them. And mm -hmm. by doing that, we actually found that not only does over the needle reduce leaking in our study, which aligns with what we found in the literature, it impacted most the person with a BMI over 40. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. If you're going to the 2023 Annual Congress in Seattle, then listen up. This is your chance to see Jeremy and Sharon in person and attend a live podcast taping. And even better, get some CE credit out of the deal. Mark your calendars for Sunday, August 20th at 3.15 in the afternoon because Jeremy and Sharon will be conducting a live podcast taping at that 2023 AANA Annual Congress in the stunning city of Seattle, Washington. You are cordially invited to join this enlightening conversation. Their topic, they will always be listening, utilizing podcasts in your curriculum and personal life for continued learning, 
It's an event designed for students, professionals, and indeed anyone with a hunger for learning. They'll delve deep into how you can leverage podcasts as a powerful learning tool in your daily routine. But that's not all. By attending this live taping, you're not just gaining invaluable insights, you're also earning one Class A CE credit. It's a fantastic opportunity to learn, engage, and earn educational credits all at once. So don't forget, Sunday, August 20th at 315 at the AANA Annual Congress in Seattle. Be there for Beyond the Mask and go on this journey of learning together with Jeremy and Sharon. So what were some of the challenges in doing this retroactive, uh, retrospective study, which is retroactive? So, um, <laughs> so tell us, tell us about that. Uh, yeah, I'm sure every student out there can are probably shouting into their their phone or rather listening to this podcast on because the problem of retrospective studies is you know you're just limited to what you find in the charts mm-hmm. and what we found was is um the acute pain service, you know, a lot of these um, distal sciatic catheters were placed in conjunction with um, the saphenous nerve, um, adductor canal, because a lot of them were used for like the middle malleolus procedures and all that. Well, when, you know, the clinician, whether it was a serenade or the student would call the patient and ask, hey, it's a catheter waking. They just said yes or no. They didn't tell us which one. So overall, we had to um, include, we just made two groups. We had Two groups that both received a continuous adductor canal and a distal sciatic. Um, one of them was over the needle, the other was through, and then overall did that impact leaking. So that was a little bit of a challenge for us of being limited to, um, you know, what was in the charts. And then we did learn something from it from our professor. He was like, you know, take this moving forward that when you are re- looking into a practice change in your own institution, make sure you're clear in your documentation so you can actually determine that if you're doing a retrospective study. That's a, that's Hmm. a very good point. So Mm -hmm. uh, Amanda, whenever you were looking at the pain scores, which I Mm -hmm. hate pain scores, but that's a whole (laughs) other podcast. uh, And you had your two groups with the Mm -hmm. over the needle and through the needle. And uh, what did you find? So unfortunately, the pain scores wasn't any, uh, we didn't find anything statistically significant with the pain scores with changing methods. But that is um, true with the literature that we found in all of our studies, no matter the method that they use or using the catheter over the needle, pain scores weren't influenced. They didn't change. They were pretty much the same, no matter even through the needle or over the needle. But the one thing that we really want to highlight, while that might not be significant, the amount of calls that a provider might receive throughout the night probably would significantly decrease by using the catheter over the needle method because a patient's going to be significantly alarmed if there's fluid coming out of their body mm-hmm. at night and immediately call their provider or whoever they need to reach out to to say, hey, something's wrong, whereas using this newer method might might limit that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the pace score, though, was interesting, though, because our thought was as students were like, okay, if you're optimizing medication delivery to the site, then why is it not making Mm -hmm. a difference on their pain score? And so that's a whole other box of questions that's actually being looked at right now in the literature um, that maybe the infusions that people are, that clinicians are putting these Mm -hmm. catheters to, um, they're too high. And so they're looking into maybe lowering them. There's research out there to maybe switching them to a bolus um, dose. We talked to an anesthesia group out in Kansas. That's what they're doing. Um, so, you know, laboring epidurals, there's this trend to use bolus um, local anesthetics with them, maybe doing the same thing with these peripheral nerve catheters. So the crux of your study didn't do anything as far as how, how much the infusion was. You're just... No, that was a secondary finding. It was something we looked into. We just noticed in the literature that, hey, these catheters are decreasing leaking by a lot when you put them over the needle. Mm-hmm. But why is it not impacting pain scores? Because they looked at that, too, and all five randomized controls, it made no difference. Hmm. So hmm. that was our next question. Well, then why does it matter if it's still leaking, which is what Amanda mm-hmm. was saying. Well, it matters because it patients don't have confidence in it, surgeons don't have confidence in it, you know, more likely to dislodge, we think, if the dressing's wet. But yeah, we thought that was an interesting, like, secondary finding mm-hmm. of our primary question. Yeah, interesting. Of course, somebody like Jeremy might be alarmed if there's fluid coming out. Right. And Absolutely. he didn't know what really it was. So that makes, yeah. yeah, that yeah. makes sense to me. Well, and we learned that from uh, when we were acute pain service, one of the patients I followed up with, he came to the, he had a shoulder surgery in a um, inner scanning uh, catheter place and um, it started leaking and it came out and he wanted his money back. He came to the emergency <laughs> department and he was like, I paid for this treatment. Mm-hmm. It didn't work. It was leaking. So it's like addressing that 
but so if, you know if it doesn't lower pain scores if it isn't you know keeping them in longer if only just to address that like that's why we felt like we needed the study to us was important mm -hmm. and to the people that do these catheters it just helps with that element of patient care right but, i mean patient satisfaction is number one so yeah. well that yeah. those surveys well, number one everything. is they want to make sure they live okay that's number one <laughs> right, that's yeah, so, yeah. number two they want to be satisfied you know wake <laughs> me up you know it's kind of funny when i went to get my colonoscopy that was one thing you know I thought I would fight the anesthetic, you know, I'm sitting there, I'm looking, I'm laying on my side. I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm not going down. I'm just going to, we always win. We always you, know, <laughs> you always win. You always win. Attention nurse anesthetists. Are you ready to take the first step toward being your own boss? Well, join us for a deep dive into the world of 1099 work with the upcoming workshop, Understanding the 1099 Landscape for CRNAs. Discover the key differences between W-2, PRN, and 1099 work, and equip yourself with essential knowledge, tools, and real-life case studies to make a confident switch to 1099. Not only will you earn up to 5.75 Class A CE credits, but you'll also have the opportunity to learn from the industry's finest, Jeremy Stanley, Sharon Pierce, and and more seasoned experts. Plus, enjoy the vibrant sun and golden beaches of Fort Lauderdale while you're at it. This event, approved by the American Association of Nurse Anesthesiology, is set for October 19th at the luxurious Marriott Harbor Beach Resort and Spa. Register now and take the first step toward being your own boss and potentially unlock higher earning potential as a 1099 employee. You can register right now at 1099workshop.aana.com. We'll also link to that in the description of today's show. This is an event not to be missed. We'll see you in Fort Lauderdale. So what else do you think needs to be added to your research um, moving forward to kind of get some more clarity on this topic? More randomized controls, mm -hmm. like the ones that, like what Amanda was saying, that the five that exist, um, three of them are financed by the people who have a financial interest mm -hmm. in the performance of the catheter. The um, pig study that's widely studied, that's the payank over the needle set, which was used in our study. Mm -hmm. But it would, there's just an opportunity, just like with everything in regional anesthesia, the people who do that, it's definitely the wild west of anesthesia. There's so much opportunity to right. kind of to make a, more evidence for the, the practices that people are doing. And um, that's what we think moving forward is this should be looked up maybe with the adductor canal over the needle. They actually leak more in literature. Versus, we did a literature review of all the leak rates of all the different catheters and the randomized controls that we looked at. Those were for the femoral um, block, which isn't used anymore. It's been replaced by the adductor canal. So that's what we think moving forward. We, Good see. And I think for any SRNA students listening that might be interested in maybe doing something like this, like what Annie was saying, is just setting clear standards for charting for a hospital that might be willing to do something like this. Just just because I think that would have really helped us out instead of going there and trying to get all this research and then kind of having to switch gears and do something that we weren't really planned on planned on doing. Well, um, what I'm hearing is nurse anesthetists need to be involved whenever the EPIC template is being laid out. Because, Absolutely. yeah, yeah. Uh, a friend of mine, Tracy Castleman, they're just implementing Epic where she's at. And there were a lot of problems whenever they first they first started it because CRNAs did not have any say in the templating of Epic. So maybe part of what you guys need to do is, even though you're graduating, is <laughs> to put that put that information out there what would have been helpful to you guys when y'all were doing this study if it would have been in the chart hands down which one was leaking mm -hmm. it was either yes or no so we couldn't tweeze out if it was the one that was placed over the needle or not so we just like we said earlier we had to make the groups but it, it would have been that and if we knew you know it was on the side leg or the, the one on the lower leg but we understand that that can be a little bit confusing for patients to answer but but yeah that would have been helpful. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's that's good information. So, Amanda, do you think that there's going to be a place for these continuous peripheral nerve catheters now that we have these new local anesthetics uh, going forward? I mean, absolutely. That are long acting. Yeah. Xperel mm -hmm. is amazing. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I I think so for sure. Yeah. Yeah, so this is another, so when our study, or when we were rotating through, mm -hmm. um, 
we met a lot of people who are anesthesiologists and CRNAs alike who are like, why are you looking at this? They're not going to be relevant with the expiro and the mm-hmm. long, long-term local anesthetics. Um, we feel like that's not the case because, um, you know, a lot of people can't um, tolerate a lot of the side effects of the um, the uh, blocks that are placed. Like, um, they ended up, you know, the patient that had Horner syndrome, mm-hmm. and they were complaining about the blurry vision. Right. So she was told to tell them, to just take the catheter out. Well, that's not an option for people who have, like, long-acting liposomal Good point. So um, we think it's still relevant, even though we do meet a lot of people who are, like, this is a dying area of, an- of regional anesthesia. It's not worth our time looking at it. Yeah. Well, guys, great job. As we kind of wrap up here, anything you feel like we should conclude on or you want to get across to our listeners? Uh, What we would like to conclude on is um, overall what we learned was, I I guess it's important to have evidence to do the things you do. And a lot of the practice that preferences that we saw of people in regional anesthesia, like with anesthesiologists, CRNAs at our clinical sites, a lot of things they do is based off of their opinion you know, when we said place it up, like we're looking and putting it over the needle, you know, we would hear, well, that's not going to work. I did that for a while and it never worked. They, they just came or, you know, the leaking isn't because of the diameters. It's because of um, this reason or whatever. So overall, I think the lesson that we learned was the importance of, of evidence for doing the things that you do instead of just doing it based off of because this is how we always did it. Well, I think the other thing that's uh, learning here is to send your study to beyond the mask to the (laughs) doctoral committee because now you've enlarged your audience from just the committee that you have with your study itself and your immediate facilities that you worked with of course all the crnas there would have known about your your study but now You've reached thousands of people by telling about your experience at your program. So if there are any students who are listening here who are doing projects, you submit them and our committee will take a look. And if it rises to the level for Sandy and Nancy's uh, stringent criterion (laughs) of looking at the studies, you may be on the podcast and disseminate your information. So this will count as part of your dissemination piece Right, Annie, Amanda? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. We That's appreciate awesome. your time. That's awesome. Well, we, we thank you guys. Any words of wisdom as you guys are done by uh, all sakes and graduating tomorrow? Any words of wisdom for SRNAs out there, maybe listening, starting the program? Anything you'd like to say to them? There is light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> it's long, but and, it's there. And it's not a train. <laughs> it's not a train. It might fill out. It's yeah. worth it. That's awesome. Well, good. Well, Annie, Amanda, congratulations. I I know it's a tough road to hoe, but uh, you guys did it. You're there. And uh, thank you for being on the show today. We can't wait to see what both you guys do in the CRNA community to help and give back. And you're doing that today. So this is kind of, uh, you know, a a foray into that. And um, we want to wish you luck. Thank Thank you. you Thank you for your time. Absolutely. Well, Sharon, I think it's a wrap. I think so. We want to thank our listeners for listening to Beyond the Mass with Jeremy Stanley and Sharon Pierce. If they like our show, Sharon, how can they help us continue to grow? Well, the best way to help us grow is to leave us a review, but make it positive. Five stars, make it positive. We know there's enough negativity in this world, right? (laughs) Isn't that the truth? Absolutely. (laughs) Um, Tell all your friends, follow us on social media. As we all know, we grow the most by word of mouth. That's right. We're in the top 50 medical podcasts and number one in the CRNA community. And uh, we want to be number one overall. And we can't do it without our listeners. Isn't that the truth? And we had two listeners on today. They listen to us all the time. God bless yes, them. Ma'am. Yes, <laughs> we are absolutely. Big fans and our class is very excited to hear that we're doing this. So absolutely. that was a pop last night. We appreciate it. <laughs> absolutely. Well, Sharon, I think it's a wrap. I think so. Beyond the Mask is made possible by the team at CRNA Financial Planning. With almost two decades of experience, the firm guides CRNAs through the complexities of investing and financial planning. Schedule a free consultation today by calling 855-304-3748 or go online to crnafinancialplanning.com. 
Hi, this is Jackie Rolls, President of the International Federation of Nurse Anesthetists and President and Founder of Our Hearts, Your Hands, a global anesthesia support community that takes donations to allow nurse anesthetists in low and middle income countries to go to educational programs, buy equipment or textbooks. Your donations are tax deductible and we would appreciate your support. Be sure to subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and anywhere you like to listen to shows. Also, be sure to check out beyondthemaskpodcast.com. Each episode is posted there with a corresponding blog post, and we timestamp important parts of the episode to help you quickly get to the content you're looking for. Also, check out the special series section on the site. You can follow along and catch up on the CRNA History Series, episodes specifically about political conversations in the industry, or try the CRNA Personal Finance Series. It's all on beyondthemaskpodcast.com. And if you have a question for the show or want to be a guest or even suggest a particular topic, fill out the contact form on the site or send an email directly to us at info at beyondthemaskpodcast.com. And lastly, let's take the conversation social. Check out our Beyond the Mask podcast Facebook page and Facebook group.